Hello and welcome to Always Take Notes. In this episode, Cassia and I spoke with the author Lucy Hughes Hallett. We began by discussing her early career as a features writer at Vogue and her time as a TV critic for the Evening Standard, before moving on to talk about her books, including The Pike, winner of the Samuel Johnson Prize, and Peculiar Ground, her recent novel. It was a really fascinating conversation and we hope you enjoy the episode. Hello, well, thank you very much for uh, welcoming us to your home, Lucy. It's very kind of you to to have us. We'd like to start off, as we always do, by talking about people's um, early careers and their kind of entry into writing. Okay, well, I think my entry into writing started almost as far back as I can remember. I always thought I was going to be a writer, and I wrote poetry in my teens, as many people do, completely stopped as soon as I sort of left school, I think. I think it wasn't too bad, my poetry, but I, I now can't imagine how I wrote it because it seems to be rather a mysterious process, poetry writing. But anyway, I was one of those sort of silent, uh, shy adolescents, and I think being a rather quiet and unpopular teenager is very, very good for a writer because it means you have plenty of time to sit at home reading books, which, of course, is far and away the best way to learn how to how to write and then I I went to university I read English um, and I think all along I was thinking one day I will be a writer and I think that's that's a terrible trap for people actually to think too much about being a writer when actually what you should be doing is writing Mm. but I was of course I was writing I mean that's what you do when you're at university And then I made the great mistake of thinking that because I loved writing and wanted to make that my life, that somehow a job in publishing would be a good idea. But of course, publishing is a completely different process from writing. Mm. And I still, I'm, I I still, I'm rather uh, awestruck by publishers. My husband and my daughter are both publishers. And it seems to be very difficult to to distinguish between a book that's not quite good enough and one that is publishable. Whereas, of course, as readers, you're mostly looking for books that are absolutely five-star wonderful mm. and there's no reason to spend any time thinking about any others. But anyway, so I did a year working as a secretary in, um, in Macmillan Publishing. And then the very nice editor, who was my boss took me out to a very good lunch a Chinese restaurant in Soho and she sacked me but she did it so politely and sweetly that it wasn't till I got home that evening to the sort of shared flat where I was living with a whole load of other people and said I'm leaving my job you know it's wonderful I'm going to do something much more exciting I don't know what yet but and my flatmate said but why why are you leaving and I suddenly thought oh I think the reason I'm leaving is that I've just been sacked. <laughs> what a gift. <laughs> but what a gift. Actually, it really was, because I wasn't getting anywhere there. And then by great... I'm sort of, it, it fell out well, because I'd entered the Vogue Talent Contest, which mm. I think still exists, mm-hmm. and was a sort of brilliant way I had, of getting into... I did not win. <laughs> well, it's it's a wonderful way of recruiting people because actually it's completely, you know, it's open to everyone. It, you know, it's pure meritocracy. If you write well, you get the job, and which it's not the kind of thing that most people associate with Vogue, really. But it really was. And in those days, it was very difficult to get to work on any of the kind of mainstream newspapers because the. The union operated a closed shop, so you know you couldn't get a job until you got a union card, and you couldn't get a union card until you got a job. So it was one of those um, circular situations. But um, Vogue was a way in because it wasn't unionised, and they published that the then editor of Vogue, Beatrix Miller, was a, a wonderful woman um, who had very little interest in fashion, and she loved the features department. So it was a great time to be there. And I mean, I started off as a very sort of junior assistant, putting photographs away tidily in drawers. But after a bit, I started writing features. And one had sort of extraordinary access, because if you rang up 
anyone and said, I'd like to write a profile of you, they wouldn't really care about, you know, this unheard of girl called Lucy Hughes Hallett who wanted to come and interview them. But they'd be very interested in the fact that it would be David Bailey or Snowden taking the photograph. Mm. So most people would say yes for that reason. And then I would get lots of lots of space and I wrote sort of five thousand word, six thousand word profiles of a lot of my heroes. What was journalism kind of like in that period we talked uh, we had Max Hastings on the show a few weeks ago and, and talked to him about this and I suppose for our generation who who came of age as, as writers and reporters that was all falling to pieces it's often romanticised and portrayed as something of a, a golden age but for someone who was working and operating as a as a young person in that time was it a wonderful time to be a reporter or well I I wouldn't call myself a reporter I mean there was a sort of huge difference between the kind of work that I imagine that Max Hastings would have been doing at the beginning of his career. You know, I was never in Fleet Street. I mean, by the time I was writing for, you know, what are loosely called Fleet Street newspapers, uh, already a kind of a change had come. And anyway, I was working as a freelance, so I was never in the office. I haven't really had an office job since since I left Vogue. And, and then, for one year after that, I worked on a news magazine called Now, which folded after a year. Uh, so I never had that, you know, being in Fleet Street, wonderful boozy lunches and the mm. cheddar cheese or whatever. I was never part of that world. Um, and, but it was, I, I think there was a, certainly, a, a, you know, a sense of, of, of possibility and that anyone could do anything. I think, you know, be, so this was back in the 70s I started working and actually the last thing anyone wanted was a job because we, you know, you wanted to be just bumming around having a good time and one would have to get a job in order to pay the rent. But the sort of anxiety that people coming out of university have now, sort of, you know, their desperate, desperate need to find a job, any job, uh, we didn't have it. I think we all, all assumed, not necessarily we get the job of our dreams, but that we would find something that we could do. So there was that difference. Um... But I, d- I don't feel I can generalise very much. And maybe that maybe one shouldn't anyway, because I think everyone's path into writing is mm. is pretty sort of different from every other. Did Vogue, and particularly the Features Death, have a very sort of strong um, training or influence on your later writing? Was there a real sort of um, belief that people were trained up and the, the profiles were kind of invested in? Or was it just something you, you kind of fell into or perhaps had a natural gift for? Um, there was nothing that you could possibly call training. Um, Miss Miller, as she was to me, uh, a few people called her B, but uh, I was always very much in awe of her. But she would read my pieces and then she would scribble UG, U-G-H, exclamation mark, where she thought I'd sort of written something a bit too purple or gone too much overboard. Um, and that was my training. That was the only training I got. It's really funny. I once um, spoke to a writer who'd worked for Anna Winter at Vogue, Mm. and she described a similar experience of writing features. And uh, she would be told, I I got bored around about here with a little cross. That's actually so useful. (laughs) And then off you go, and that was it. And she had to sort of figure out where she'd gone wrong and how to structure and just sort of work it out for herself. It sounds like it was rather similar for you. Isn't it still... I mean, have you been trained? I mean, does anyone get trained? I went to journalism school. But because oh, did you? I had a scholarship, I had a, a Fulbright to the States, so I went to... And was that useful? It was an extraordinary experience. Yeah. Um, because... It, and I then worked at the New York Times afterwards and, and things. So it took me into a completely different milo and exposed me to completely different things. But um, it would have cost an enormous amount of money if the US government wasn't paying for it. Mm-hmm. And I... And there is the sort of thing, of, you know, can it be taught in the classroom? I don't, I don't know. So for me, it was yeah. hugely tied up with the experience of being in the States. But I, I was going to ask, just following from uh, Cassia's point, as, as a working environment, you know, um, I suppose the, the public preconception one has of, of magazines like this, come, the whole Devil Wears Prada thing and things like that. What was it? Was it a pleasant place to work at that time? Or was it? Uh, yeah, it was. It was. I enjoyed it very much. It was a very female place, and I mostly have worked with with women. Um, Well, that's not really true, but certainly up until the end of my time at Vogue, 
I only really worked with women because, of course, I studied English at university, which was then seen as being a girl's subject, and a very high proportion of the sort of teaching staff were female as well. Uh, so that was, uh, I think that probably was rather um, um, it, it just took away a whole level of anxiety. I remember when I first started working around men, and the first time was at that um, magazine now, finding it rather strange because up until that point, I think I'd seen men as sort of frivolous creatures whom one flirted with at parties. So, you know, it, it was rather odd having to have a proper working conversation with, you know, an art director or a sub-editor who, who was male. So that was something rather particular about working for a fashion magazine, as it already primarily was. But then, um, after that, I went freelance, and far and away the best working environment, I think, is your own home. So. And what was it that, that took you away from Vogue and then towards you know your work at the Evening Standard as a, as a freelance writer? Um, money, I suppose. I mean, it, Vogue was a wonderful place to work, but we were very... We weren't paid very well. And so then I was offered a very large amount of money by Now magazine, um, because it was a new magazine and it was funded by Jimmy Goldsmith, who was trying to poach people from all the you know, papers and, and magazines. So people were having to give up secure jobs in order mm. to go there. And obviously you didn't do that for something which might not last unless the pay was very good. So he was being very generous, and that was very exciting. So suddenly I thought, I, can, I might be able to actually go on holiday. You know, so mm. It was quite exciting. And, but so then I took that job, and then the, pe the magazine folded, and actually with what I'd done with my wonderful Goldsmith salary was um, buy a flat, take on a mortgage. So then I had to work very hard indeed to keep up the payments. And I remember, you know, on Vogue, if I was, say, writing a profile of John Updike, I would take a month over it and I would read every book he'd ever written and I would talk to lots of other people and then I'd do the interview and then maybe I'd ask for another interview. I mean, not in Updike's case because he wouldn't be around, but if the subject was in London. And, you know, the whole thing would be very carefully considered and long and slow. And then suddenly there I was, a sort of freelance feature writer adrift in, in Fleet Street. And I can remember someone from the Evening Standard ringing me and saying, could you go and write a piece on some actor? And I, I said, yeah, sure, you know, when do you want it? Thinking he'd say, you know, the end of next week. And he said, uh, could you do three o'clock? And I, and I suddenly realised, actually, of course I could. You know, mm. you can. You can always do it by three o'clock if necessary. Um, but so that was... I mean, I think the kind of, you know, the moves in my professional life back then, you know, I was just trying to scrape a living. And then the, the Evening Standard television reviewing job was a fantastic boon. I, I was so lucky to get that. And... When did that start? Oh, God, I can't remember. <laughs> Around 1980, perhaps? Mm -hmm. Maybe a bit Wasn't later. William Boyd a TV critic at a similar time? I don't States, but... know. Um, I don't know. Um, I think Clive, Clive James, Clive James yeah. was. Julian Barnes was. And it's, it's, a, it's a lovely job being a TV critic because basically, you know, the whole world crops up on television. So it really an opportunity to comment on whatever is going on in the world. And it's very, um, it's very unsupervised in some way. I mean, I think that if you're sort of, you know, a newspaper's leader writer, you probably have to clear it with the editor what line you're going to take mm. on whatever subject. Whereas somehow the, the sort of arts pages are seen as being a kind of playroom where you can say whatever you like. And what was your, your first move towards writing books? How did that come about? Well, I, it's tied up with the television reviewing because the Evening Standard, as you know, is an evening paper, so the deadlines were early morning. So I had to get my copy in by 8 o'clock. And my getting that job coincided rather wonderfully with 
a sort of change in the technology so that I could actually watch everything I needed to watch for the week on video. The motorbike messengers would arrive outside the shared flat I was living in with these cl- huge clunky great video cassettes. And so I could do my viewing on, on the Monday. Um, any time, I think up to even a few months before I got the job, television critics had to stay in in the evening and watch mm. off air. You know, there's no other way of doing it. But I was spared that. I was still able to have a social life and go out and have fun. But although I did all my viewing on Monday because I wanted to just keep it, I didn't want it overflowing into the rest of the week, I would write the reviews between six and eight in the morning. So, you know, my alarm would go off because somehow writing them that fast, again, it meant it would it didn't spread. You know, mm. if, you've, if you've got a deadline, you just do it in that time. Otherwise, if you give yourself all week, it takes all week. But so I would get up at six um, and I'd have to be on the phone to the copy takers by 7.30. So... I would just, you know, blast out 600 words. And, of course, you know, this was long before email or whatever, so, you know, you were dictating it over the phone to the copy copy takers who were very patient people, but they did often mishear. Of course they did. So very often it came out garbled. <laughs> so I would have to... I learned very quickly not to read the paper because I would always be, oh, no, they got that wrong, which was upsetting. But anyway, I I, I remember I, I had my desk then by a big bay window overlooking the street and I would sit between, you know, the hours of six and eight when I was doing my review. I would see the street gradually fill up with people going to work and I'd sit there feeling rather smug because by eight o'clock in the morning... I'd earned my living, Mm. which meant that it was then possible to write a book, which, you know, before that, you know, how how anyone manages to write a book, unless they have a huge private income, I I can't really conceive. They must be much better at working late at night than I am. I, I seem to get much less clever after a certain point in the evening. Your first two books sort of deal with kind of cultural icons... Can you talk a little bit about um, the sort of the subjects of those two books and how they came about, and you know, how, how, where did the ideas or- originate for them? Was it with you, or was it you know, did you get approached to write a book? Um, always with me. I think that um, I, yeah, I've I've all for me, my book writing has always been where I sort of followed up ideas that were wandering around my own mind whereas my journalism has been what I did to order Mm. so yeah the first book was about Cleopatra but actually that's not where the idea began it my first idea was to write a book about propaganda and the way that you can take a single set of events documented facts and make of them pretty much what you will Mm. so that they can carry absolutely any ideological message and rather than writing a kind of theoretical essay on that I thought what would be more fun would be to take a single story a a story based on on fact and see what had been done to it over over the years and and so it could have been anyone Um, and I was sort of toying with other possibilities, I mean, Napoleon would have been an obvious one because he's been so much mm. written about Jesus Christ would, would have been another interesting case. But then as soon as I thought of Cleopatra, it was obvious that she was perfect because um, she's female, mm-hmm. which means that in looking at the way people have written about her or made films about her or painted pictures of her, once talking about you know, the representation of, of women... Uh, she's foreign from the point of view of a Western reader or writer, so that it in writing about her I could explore attitudes to race. Um, and there was a good long span. You know, she mm. lived over two thousand years ago, so that there was going to be a lot of material. And there's really almost never been a time in those two thousand years when people weren't writing 
thinking or talking about Cleopatra. So that, so that that was the kind of the, the setup. I would just read and look at every version of Cleopatra I could find, and and really just see what came. And I was expecting to be writing a lot about sexual politics and racial politics. But then there were all sorts of other things that, that cropped up that I hadn't expected. You know, there's a whole chapter on the ethics of suicide, because in the Middle Ages, Cleopatra was seen as being a good woman because she killed herself for love of a man, supposedly. Mm. Actually, you know, that wasn't why she killed herself at all. But as far as the medieval poets were concerned, she was um, you know, one of those good women who doesn't want to outlive her lord and master. Um, and, and at the same time, of course, suicide is a sin, according to Christian doctrine, so that's, you know, complicated things like that. And, and um, so I find myself staying tightly focused on one human being, Cleopatra, who did actually live, although we know very little about her, frankly. I mean, the documented facts are few. Um, but going off in all kinds of theoretical directions. But then the, the next book, Heroes, was sort of the reverse, in a way, in that it was all about one concept, which was hero worship, but with different people. So I looked at eight different, as it were, case studies there. And I suppose Cleopatra is my book about women, and um, Heroes is my book about masculinity and and were you working with the same publishers during this time and the same agent? And how were you running your writing life between the books and the journalism during, I suppose, a decade and a half almost that those books... Yeah, published. well, actually, there's a long gap because Cleopatra came out um, two weeks before my twin daughters were born. So then there was a bit, you know, there were a few years when I wasn't working on a book at all. And I think it was nearly ten years later that I wrote Heroes. So... Um, for Cleopatra, my agent was Pat Kavanagh, um, and it was published by Bloomsbury, by Liz Calder. But then by the time I was ready with Heroes, Liz Calder had retired, so I didn't feel any particular loyalty to Bloomsbury, although, you know, I had a good relationship with them, but um, I think on the whole people tend, you know, if, if they stay loyal to mm. a particular publisher, it's because of a particular relationship with yeah. an editor and and I also switched agents mainly because um, Felicity Rubenstein was already a very close friend of mine and she was just setting up as an agent and although Pat had served me fine I was you know I didn't I wasn't particularly close to her and so I, I switched to Felicity and she's still my agent and, and then she sort of sent out the, the proposal for Heroes to a number of different publishers, and it was bought by Nicholas Pearson at Fourth Estate, who's been my publisher for the next two books as well. In the course, because you, um, it wasn't just those two books that had a fairly long gap between you, you then, you know, your books have been relatively widely um, spaced. Yeah. Have there, has there been kind of um, pressure from agents and and your, your publishers to, you know, to, to sort of set you on a trajectory or to, to kind of mould your career or to or anything like that? Have you, have you felt any pressure? Um, actually, no. Um, and I think that suits me. And I know some writers want to be told what to do. But um, both Felicity and Nicholas have been very... Um, sort of laissez-faire, they, you know, I, I, I do what I like. I think they probably both know that I'm extremely stubborn and headstrong and it wouldn't really work if they <laughs> tried to tell me what to do. But I I think that, I mean, that, you know, that's, I'm kind of half joking. But I also think, as I said earlier, that book ideas do have to come out of your own head, otherwise it just doesn't kind of work. And I've seen friends, authors sort of struggling with some idea that's been given them by an agent or a, a commissioning editor and they're 
And, it, you know, because they're not really emotionally engaged with it, it's just a chore that they're sort of plodding through. It's really interesting. We spoke to Anthony Beaver, and he said that Stalingrad wasn't his idea. Really? Yeah, and he, he didn't want to do it. Which mm. was which was fascinating for for all the reasons that you said. Mm. He had yeah. uh, he had young children. It would mean going to Russia. He felt that it would be difficult and complicated, and mm. he wanted to write a completely different book, mm. and then got taken in that direction. But could we talk about the Pike now? About where you know where your idea for this came from? Well, that um, came very easily out of out of Heroes, the previous book, um, which was um, a boon because. I mean, after Cleopatra, as I say, you know, suddenly I had two babies to look after, and so I wasn't immediately kind of available for book writing. But then once the girls were at school and I was thinking what to do next, it took me a while to find something I really wanted to get started on. And I like having something I'm working on. And all that time I was doing lots of reviewing and other work, but having a sort of big you know, a, a book-length project is is very satisfying. It's nice to have that going as well. And there just wasn't much I wanted to write about until the idea for Heroes came to me. But in the, the next the next time, you know, I finished Heroes, and I'd actually already started writing about Donutsu. I'd had this crazy idea. It didn't make any sense uh, that I would fit a chapter on Donuzio into the Heroes book. And I started writing it, and I'd written about 40,000 words before I realised, for, for one thing, this was a, a sort of monstrous excrescence mm. on the book. I mean, each of the, the eight biographical essays in that book, and none of them is as long as that. So, you know, it, it was a sort of cuckoo, a sort of monster child, which had mm. landed itself into this already existing book. So I came to my senses, took Donuzio out of Heroes, put it aside, thought, you know, that's next, and, and finished Heroes. And the thing is, the last chapter of the Heroes book, um, and the whole book is about, well, to sum up rather crudely, it's about the dangers of hero worship and the kind of irrational emotions that people project onto the people to whom they give political power and, you know, model we all get into as a result and the last section was about the way that people like Nietzsche and Carlyle talking about supermen in the 19th century opened the way for the 20th century dictators and Denuncio was very much part of that story because he certainly saw himself as a Nietzschean superman and he was one of the very few intellectuals writers thinkers who kind of took those ideas you know, out of the library into the kind of field of political action because you know, in 1919 he made himself dictator of Fiume and he actually, you know, he, he started to, to, to live his theories. And, and, and anyway, he's, he's a, a great subject and as soon mm. as I started to read about him, thinking I'd just sort of squeeze a few paragraphs on him into that final chapter of Heroes, um, I realised that the the wealth of material was astonishing because he wrote all the time. He had notebooks in his pocket and wrote in them non-stop. You sometimes think, you know, how did he get time to live? Because he would write down what he was eating, he would write down what he was reading, um, what he thought about what he was reading. He described every woman he met. He would put in his notebook what he planned to do with her, and then he would describe what... He would sometimes think, how did he ever manage to have sex? He was so busy writing about it. That <laughs> must have been rather annoying for the woman when he said, you know, hang on, just reach for my notebook. But, um, so there was all that. But also, I mean, he's not really known in this country much, but he was in his lifetime, over most of Europe, a vast celebrity. So everyone who met him would hurry home and start writing in their notebooks or their letters, oh, I've met Denuncia today and this is what he's like. And actually he's a bit of a monster and in it there were mm. very sort of, he was a very flamboyant character and a lot of very colourful anecdotes about him. So a sort of gift in that way. But also I think it kind of, although they seem very different, Cleopatra, Heroes and Denuncia, they're all actually exploring the same subject matter of, of propaganda and kind of spin-doctoring and the kind of politics as theatre 
um, he didn't see as a great mm. artist in politics as theatre. You know, he was always he was always on stage, as it were, in his political actions. So they kind of, in my mind anyway, they hang together as a kind of trilogy. This mm. those three. Perhaps this isn't so much the case for um, Cleopatra, but um, for the Pike and for Heroes, perhaps it is. I've read somewhere that you said um, about um, D'Annunzio, disapproval is not an interesting response. And yet he, as you say, lived a, a very colourful and life and, and was a bit of a, a monster. How um, useful is it to separate your own emotions and judgment from the subject that when you're writing about someone of this kind? Um, I don't think moral judgment has any place in, in my equipment as a writer, which doesn't mean I'm a completely immoral person, I hope. But I mean, often, as I was reading about Dancy or reading his work, I would find myself thinking, "How can you say that? You know, his his political views are really abhorrent to me, to, to a large extent. Particularly his the glorification of war. I mean, so." As mm. far as I have any kind of strongly held beliefs, I, I, I am a pacifist and some wars are unavoidable, but uh, there are far, far more fought than are really necessary. Whereas Domenizio was always saying, uh, you know, what Italy needs is a baptism of blood, and he was very keen that Italy should enter the First World War without really caring on, on which side, although you know, he preferred to fight against the German-Austrian axis because Austria had been, the, as he saw it, the oppressor of Italians for many centuries. But what he really did, he just wanted blood. And that, to me, is so... Um, it, it's so alien to the way I think that I'm very interested in it. And so that question of, you know, how can you think like that? wasn't just rhetorical. I really wanted to know the answer. And so to try to explore the mindset of someone who who had such a, such different attitudes to life, different from mine, seemed to me more interesting. You know, if I was just to, to be writing about some nice kind of, you know, liberal person who f- felt the same way as I did, I don't know whether I'd find that particularly stimulating. I, I know what it's like to be that sort of person. Could you tell us about the, the research process in terms of, uh, do you speak Italian and what materials were you using? How did you go about putting this together? I, 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 I read Italian. I, I hesitate and, and stammer because I can hardly claim to speak Italian. I, I find conversational Italian very difficult. Mm. But as a reader... I'm I'm fluent. I can I can read it all, and and I got better in the course of researching that book because all of my source material was in Italian. I just jolly well had to read Italian, and and Danunzio's Italian is very florid and highfalutin and um, quite complicated, but in a funny way that makes it easier because it's very Latinate. And if you've you know if you've studied Latin, actually you can guess at a lot of it. Um, but anyway, I went, I mean, you know, to go backwards, I went to Italy um, between school and university in what would nowadays be called my gap year. And so I, you know, I, I had Italian and, and loved Italy. And so I mean, part of the pleasure of writing about Donizio was being in Italy in my head all the time that I was researching and writing it. And sometimes not just in my head, but in, in fact, too, I mean, Unfortunately, the, the, the British Library and the London Library both have excellent collections of Italian books, so I, didn't, I couldn't really make excuses for going to spend as many months researching in Italy as I would have liked. But I did go quite a lot. There's a lot of stuff I needed and enjoyed following up there. But um, and I've never... Uh, I'm always rather puzzled by... If you read uh, interviews with writers and they say, oh, well, I've spent two years researching this book and then two years writing it. And for me, the re- research and the writing have always gone hand in hand, you know, that um, I would find some some source material which would set me off on some line of thought which I would then write and then that would eventually become incorporated into the final draft of the book, but probably not in the order in which it was written. So 
it's quite a, um, a mixed up process. From what I've read, it had um, quite a sort of slow burn um, reception. Obviously, now when people think of the Pike, they think about it as having won um, the Samuel Johnson Prize and, and the Costa Prize. But that, as, as far as I understand, it happened sort of a little while after publication. Can you talk a little bit, a bit about uh, about that kind of initial um, phase after it had been published and the response it got, and then the impact of winning those prizes? Right. Well, it came out, I think, in January. Um, and it came out and it got good reviews, lovely reviews, actually. So that was all fine. Um, and and But then, as you say, months went by because the kind of the prizes are rather a sort of delayed action thing. They're often for the books published in the previous year. And so then... Um, the first was the Samuel Johnson Prize, and that was that was fantastic. Although I remember the day that Nicholas, my publisher, rang to tell me that I was on the shortlist for that prize. I was actually at my parents' house. Um, my mother died, my father was still alive but in a care home, and my brothers and I had decided to, that we had to sell the house. And I was she sort of seeing all these removal vans which were sort of leaving the house and any house, even if it's not a very big one has an awful lot of clutter in it and so the, all this stuff, all my parents' possessions a lot of them just going to the dump you know, old mm. sofas and mattresses you know, stuff that nobody was ever going to want and it was incredibly painful so actually, I got the great news that I was shortlisted for this prize but it remains one of the saddest days of my life. So, you know, um, one's, one's book life does go alongside real life. And um, another instance of that actually was when Cleopatra came out. And I can remember Dan, my husband, coming into the maternity ward. And I was in hospital for about two weeks when my twin daughters were born because the second one was very small and there were worries about her. So stayed in the hospital and, and I remember Dad coming in with the reviews and you know I'd been looking forward all my life to publishing a book and f- seeing the first reviews of it and when he came in I just thought oh I'll take this thing. all I wanted to do was sleep I didn't want to look at anything so that again you know life kind of you know one's personal life and one's sort of literary career are not always in perfect sync. But anyway, okay, got over the sadness of the, the day of the removal vans. Um, and it was it was lovely to win the Samuel Johnson Prize. That felt fantastic. And um, and then came the Costa Biography Award. That was, I, I mean, and then the Duff Cooper Prize. And then the Paddy Pie Prize. And, and it just, it sort of, I mean... I, I promise you I was never at all blase, I and mean, each time it was really exciting. Um, so I don't know how much it changes anything in terms of sales or reputation, but it definitely makes the author feel good. And we always try to speak as openly as possible about money on the podcast. When you had this book that became this huge hit and winning these prizes, did that change where you were in terms of the the kind of advances you could command and you know, the appetite for other work and so forth. Did it change your financial setup as a writer dramatically? Um, I don't know. I mean, in a way, um, I don't know that. You know, I don't know... I mean, you should ask Nicholas Pearson. Would he mm. have given me a bigger advance otherwise for, for, for the, the novel? Um, or, I mean, a smaller advance if I hadn't won those prizes. I simply don't know the answer. I mean, I do know that um, Felicity, my agent, said, you know, once all those prizes started coming, um, come on, you know, we'd better sell your next book now. And I'd already started writing Peculiar Ground. And I said, well, you know, it's a novel. Surely with novels, you know, you don't, you don't normally sell on an outline. You, you, you finish mm. the book before you sell it. And she said, no, let, let's just do this. Um, and so I'd written, and Peculiar Ground is a quite a, a sort of long novel now. Um, it's in five parts, 
first two, uh, first and last part are set in the 17th century, the central three sections are set in the 20th century. And, but I'd, I'd started off by writing what ended up being part two of the novel, which was a small but perfectly formed story set over one weekend in 1961. And that's what I'd written at the point that Felicity was saying, come on, let's, let's sell this. And I had, I had thought that was going to be the novel. But when I'd written it, it I mean, not only was it rather short, but it just felt to me that all sorts of lines of thought had been opened up by it that I wanted to pursue. Mm. You know, I wanted to, to take it further and in several different directions. So I then, it was rather useful actually subsequently, I then gave Felicity this, it was about 35,000 words I think, um, so you know, really too short to be a novel thing, which is now part two, and I did an outline of how the rest of the novel might work which I hadn't really, you know, I hadn't sat down mm. and worked it out at that point. So it was a useful exercise for me. Although I've looked back at that synopsis and I did not follow it. I mean, the novel I wrote <laughs> is not the novel I sold, which I think is true for most books, really, isn't it? But so, so, so that was a difference, that I sold the book at that point rather than waiting till I'd finished it. And maybe, I mean, I don't know. I think if, if Felicity and Nicholas weren't both so wonderfully tolerant of my willfulness, they probably would both like to have said, actually, for goodness sake, Lucy, don't go writing a novel now. You've just written a successful biography. And, you know, do another one now, cash mm. in. Um, but I just didn't, I felt... And I was very pleased with the pike. I thought I'd done something interesting with it. And I'd taken the biographical form as far as I wanted to take it, really. And I wanted to do something different. Had you always wanted to write um, a novel? Had you had this brewing for a long time? Or was this something that came out of maybe some of that pain of seeing your, your parents' house being, you know, taken to bits? Um, I'd always wanted to write a novel, yes. And I can't really, looking back on all those years, think why I hadn't done so. I did start a novel um, when I was working for Now magazine. It seems to have cropped up a lot in this conversation, although it was only a brief period of my life. But I, I was the deputy arts editor. This weekly magazine, which only had a sort of you know, three or four arts pages, the arts editor was perfectly capable of doing it by himself. Um, and I you know, did what I could to help. But there were a lot of days when I turned up at the office and tried to look busy but didn't have very much to do. So I started writing a novel. And I think it wasn't bad. Um, and I got about halfway through it and then the magazine folded. And then, as I said earlier, you know, I had to really run very fast to on the spot to sort of keep up, you know, just to, to make a living. And so it was really probably... I suppose it was when I got the the television reviewing job, then I would have had time to sort of pick it up again. But that, you know, two or three years had gone past; it had gone stale on me, mm. and I'd had this um, my Cleopatra idea, which at that point seemed to be more exciting. So, um, you know, in some ways, I've always wanted to write a novel, but nothing was stopping me except for the fact that I kept writing other kinds of books. Did you keep up the journalism? Was that something you continued with? Oh, yes, and I still do quite a lot of reviewing, and I always like that. I think um, I'm a very slow book writer, partly because I've always kept up the journalism. You know, I've never been a full-time author. Um, you know, I've always, always been doing quite a lot of reviewing or profile writing or prize judging or teaching, you know, other things on the side, um, which I like. Um, I mean, it's partly for financial reasons. You know, I've never really reckoned to earn my living from book writing. Um, but it, there's also a pleasure... Uh, and it's quite nice if you're working on something which is going to take you years to write, um, to then write a review that you can write in a day and 
about spent, you know, another day revising the piece and then send it off and it's published by the end of the week. You know, it's nice having that instant mm. gratification. And your your husband being a publisher, is there a, a creative element to that relationship as well? Do you read each other's work or is there a... Um, um, I, I mean, I certainly... I listen to him night after night over this table telling me that the next book he's going to publish is, is one of the most brilliant books ever written. He's a very... Um, he gets very enthusiastic about the books he's publishing. Um, and that's, that's fun, that's nice. And sometimes I prick up my ears and say, oh, that really does sound rather good. Can you bring home a proof? I'd like to read it. And sometimes I'm just thinking, yeah, 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 you always say this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and he... I don't show my work to anyone until it's finished. So, I mean, I know there are writers who, you know, will give today's pages to their spouse and ask for instant feedback. I would really hate that. I can't imagine how a marriage, marriage would survive that kind of process. I do that. Do you really? <laughs> do you really? Yeah. <laughs> Gosh. Well. Um... It's probably because Olivier is far too kind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, again, Antti Beaver mentioned that his, mm. his wife, who's also a writer, is his first reader. Yeah. Um, I can't imagine anything worse than that. No. And it's partly... Th- my writing process, I suppose, I mean, I write very long first drafts, which I then cut and cut and cut and cut, and I'll, you know, I'll go through, yeah, that's my I'll go through something perhaps fifteen times, mm-hmm. and I don't, I really don't want anyone's opinion on the first fourteen drafts because I know they're not done. You know, well, I think we've probably got maybe one final question. I know that um, <laughs> a question that Simon always likes to ask people are whether, and I think I'll, I know the answer is whether you are a planner or a plunger when it comes to writing. And is that different with fiction and non-fiction? Mm. Um, um, it is different, yes. Because with non-fiction, you have a huge heap of stuff, of material. You know, once you've started researching, you know, and you have all these notes. And, you, and there's a certain amount of story you've got to tell... Oh, you haven't got to. Um, actually, I'm a sort of a great believer in leaving things out, and I, I think some of the best biographies are those which just tell about you know a few years of the subject's life. You, you don't have to do birth to death. Um, but at the same time, you know that there is, you know, you you you've got stuff that you're going to have to find a shape for, and so then the task with non-fiction, is trying to find a structure which is appropriate to the material that, you'd, that you want to fit into it. And that can be very hard work. Uh, I mean, with the pike, it took me a long time to decide where to begin. Um, and often, and I think, you know, the traditional thing, but hardly anyone does this anymore, is, you know, begin with the subject's birth. Actually, people still do that. Extraordinary how, how formally boring an awful lot of biographies are, even well-respected ones. But then the, the other obvious thing to do is to start with the most exciting bit. Um, but that was very difficult with D'Annunzio because the most exciting bit is his, uh, his escapade in fuming when he took over this small tiny mm-hmm. Croatia and made himself dictator of it. But for British readers... That's difficult because, you know, who is D'Annunzio? Where is Fiume? I couldn't assume any prior knowledge in my readers, so that seemed difficult. So then I started by thinking I'd start with the outbreak of the First World War because most people do know that story. And then I did that. And then I finally worked out that actually what I had to do was to tell the whole of D'Annunzio's life story in the first chapter which I did, and I did it from 19 different points of view because there were, you know, so many different different sources I could draw on that that was possible. And then I realised that actually I wanted to use all three of those beginnings. So, (laughs) (laughs) so, So anyway, yes, in other words, I was wrestling with the structure and trying to work out how to do it and, and, um, and making all sorts of decisions about pace, you know, I mean... In that book, some of the time I'd be going almost in real time, describing a whole day very, very slowly, and then going 
absolutely fast forward through ten years during mm. which his life was fairly repetitive, and I could just and with the novel, with your process with the novel, it's different yeah. because um, you you create the material mm. to fit the structure mm. rather than the other way around, so that the structure is is easier. But so it's it's more more plungy, le- less planned. But at the same time, there has to be a plan. And you'd already handed one in because you'd had this unusual yes, arrangement with your publisher. Yes, well then, yes. But, but that wasn't always already there. You know, I made up that mm. plan. <laughs> so, you know, you, the, the plan The plan is, for is, fiction was a work of fiction. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And now I'm writing short stories at the moment. Um, and I'm writing short stories set in Britain now based on uh, old stories. So I'm using kind of, you know, given material. Like I've, and I've just written a version of the Pied Piper and um, I'm now on one um, about Diana and Actian and both Diana and Actian are estate agents. But anyway, you know, I've got to, there's got to be a, a moment when he sees something he shouldn't because the story requires that that should happen. And that's that's quite fun. I mean, having some sort of, some sort of given, something that you're wrestling with is quite stimulating. Well, that seems a great place to stop. So uh, <laughs> thank you for being such a, a gracious and, and a candid talker about your work uh, and wishing you all the best for your projects going forward. Thank, thank you. you very much. Hello, it's us again with a swift update from our lives. Cassia, what's been going on? Well, uh, for both of us, really, the biggest news at the moment is that we are launching a Patreon um, page for Always Take Notes. Uh, We're really excited about this. Uh, It's sort of taking Always Take Notes to the next level, um, the most important aspect of which is that we will be able to finally pay our long-suffering producers and our social media editor. So we're really excited about that. So our Patreon page is patreon.com slash always take notes. And if you do choose to uh, pledge money monthly, you're eligible for a very exciting series of rewards, including a compedium of fantastic magazine pitches and the email that scored Cassia her magazine column and her literary agent and all sorts of good stuff there. As well as a completely ridiculous video of us looking like idiots in in matching tops. And featuring Cassia's dog. Um, Anyway, this has been Always Take Notes, hosted as ever by me, Simon Aikham. And me, Cassie Sinclair. Our producers are Ed Kiernan, Elizabeth Davies and Olivia Krellen. Our music is by Jess Danheiser. Zara Hankier looks after our social media. And our graphic design is by James Edgar. And we're on all manner of social media. We're on Facebook and Instagram at Always Take Notes. We're on Twitter at Take Notes Always. And our website is alwaystakenotes.com. So please do visit iTunes and leave us a review and subscribe. And please also visit our Patreon page if you would like to start donating. Thank you.